that other one. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst, uh, according to your word through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the comfort that comes from your word as the Spirit brings to mind all that we have studied, all that we have read, and helps us to apply your word into our own situations and to take courage from who you are and who we are as your people. So help us this day as we study your word uh, that we might uh, really take to heart uh, what these narratives, these stories uh, can really do for us as encouragement in these uh, even troubled times that we live. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we started last week. Hey, come on in. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We do have Karen coming here. Excellent. And so we started last week to, uh, and did, talk about Hezekiah. And immediately, I mean, the very first week, it seems like the first day he took on the, was. was anointed as king, uh, he started these reforms. And remember that his father was a very uh, bad king. We'll get this over to where we can see our little thing. And uh, the, the gold had tarnished when it got to Ahaz. And Ahaz did his own thing and uh, he uh, went in cooperation with the Assyrians and actually reached out to be an ally with these uh, people that were worshiping other things and shouldn't have been. He didn't have any trust. But Hezekiah called the people back, instituted the reforms, and established righteousness in Judah. Now, I found a, a, this is a fairly, I mean, mostly, it's a reliable date, I think, for Hezekiah's reign, and started out in uh, 716, and of course it counts backwards, because from our perspective, and uh, we get now kind of a fast forward into the fourth year of his reign and remember we'd seen all these reforms and seen all these things that he was doing three whole chapters of reforms and establishing the priesthood again and all this going on but look what happens uh in second kings and chapter 18 well actually um uh, Let's start at the beginning of that chapter, because we didn't read this passage last week, and it's okay. It's all right to kind of do a little review that way. So we'll start in 18, verse 1, and <clears throat> then we'll go down through verse 12. But notice the big break between uh, verse 8 and 9. So just be aware there's a time lapse thing going on there. All right, so let's start out with Dave, and then we'll go to Rochelle and Karen, uh, Janelle. Well, you're off camera now. <laughs> and, That's perfectly fine. I don't mind. And then I'll go, and then back to Dave. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Second Kings 18, verse 1. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Habijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria 
and did not serve him. From Watchtower to Fortified City, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. In King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, marched against Samaria and laid siege to it. At the end of three years, the Assyrians took it. So Samaria, when we're talking about the northern kingdom, was captured in Hezekiah's sixth year, which was the ninth year of Hosea, uh, king of Israel. The king of Assyria deported Israel to Assyria and settled them in Halea in Gozan on the Haber River and in towns of the Medes. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated his covenant, all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. Okay, so Hezekiah is doing the right thing, and the northern kingdom obviously is doing the wrong thing, and we saw how they were removed. This kind of summarizes it's during Hezekiah's reign that this all comes about, and the king of Assyria, in this case, Shalmaneser is his name, comes against Samaria and wipes it out and deports them. So this northern kingdom, which is actually larger than Judah and, and the, the uh, Jerusalem area, is wiped out completely. And Hezekiah, it says, has not cooperated with the Assyrians. He's actually rebelled against them. So he's in a very vulnerable spot carrying out the will of the Lord, trusting in the Lord. And all this takes place about 711 or so around that time uh, in uh, uh, BC. So all of that takes place there. And Hezekiah continues to do what is right uh, in spite of the pressure from Assyria that is surrounding them all the way around. Now, it, uh, I just want to break in a little bit and say that this took great courage <laughs> for Hezekiah to continue to do that. When his father Ahaz had made purposely tried to make this alliance with Assyria to, uh, you know, to stay in power and to stay, uh, Hezekiah was going to trust in the Lord no matter what and did all these reforms and took all this action to uh, trust in the Lord. And all this is going on, and his trust in the Lord is, is working out in all kinds of ways, even smashing the bronze snake that Moses had, you know, from way back when, in an attempt to stamp out all idolatry. These things have a way of getting corrupted over the years. The historical... Yes. So uh, let's turn now. We're kind of break in on our second Chronicles passage. And <clears throat> uh, uh, second Chronicles chapter 30. Well, it'll be 31, the very ending, verse 20 and 21. And then we'll continue after that. I'll make a few comments and then we'll continue with chapter 32. So we have two Assyrian kings. First is Shalmaneser that wipes out the northern kingdom. And then later on, there's going to be this other one that comes against them. All right. So that's what's going on. So Second Chronicles uh, 31, uh, we didn't read it all together, uh, but it had to do with the worship and establishing the priests and the genealogical records and things like that. He's doing everything possible to keep this revival going and establish what is has been done in a righteous way. So let's uh, break in here in verse 20 and read 20 and 21. This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly. And so he prospered. 
Yeah, we see not just survival, but prospering going on. We see that Judah, in the midst of all the Assyrian threat around them, is doing the right things, and God is blessing them. And everything looks like, oh, wonderful. But now, let's go right ahead into chapter 32. And I think it's my turn. After all that, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. Just hold on a second. I don't want you to miss this. You're, uh, the application here is straight out for us, too. You can take all these kind of reforms. You can do better than your ancestors have done. You can do the right things. You can do right thing after right thing. Reverse the course of your family history. And still, God will permit, at times, trouble to come against you. Is God out to get you? No. We live in a sinful world. And they're surrounded by all kinds, we're surrounded by all kinds of evil. And just because Hezekiah is doing the right thing, and even prospering for a time, doesn't mean that, um, that it's always going to be that way, or that he's somehow fallen off and done something wrong or anything like that, and God is out to get him. None of that is in view. He's doing the right thing. We've just read passages talking about him doing the right thing like no one else had. But sometimes we feel like, oh, God is out to get me because this is happening against me. Or this, is, I'm doing everything right. And then, oh, all these bad things are happening. What's going on? Maybe there's no God anymore. None of that takes place for Hezekiah. But, uh, and for us too, we don't want to lose hope in the midst of this. We just live in a world filled with evil, and even if we're doing the right things, there's still going to be bad things that happen around us. All right, so we're, we're breaking it. I just don't want you to miss that, because that's so critical. I think that is the most important lesson in this whole passage, actually. So uh, I think we're ready for Dave. You can continue with verse 2 now. <laughs> When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard, repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He rebuilt another wall outside that one and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. So he's acting as a king should, working with the people, building up the defenses. This is what a king does. Uh, this is not an aggressive army. This is for the defenses. He trusts in the Lord, but he's still being cautious and still uh, acting as a king should, uh, taking proper um, military uh, uh, protection here for his people. Verse 6, he appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gain confidence from what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. I hope that you take these words right to heart. <laughs> These are words that you can apply right into your own situation. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. For there's a greater power with us than with him. And the Apostle Paul, I believe, take this, takes us right to heart too and, and writes to us in Romans 8. If God be for us, who can be against us? 
And this is something that each generation of uh, believers in the Lord can take to heart and apply right to our own situations. And uh, with verse 8, with him is only an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord, the great I am our God, to help us and to fight our battles. Now, they're still arming themselves, and they're still taking proper precautions, but they had the promise that God would fight for them and defend them, and, uh, and we have that promise too. And even if we should be killed physically, that does not mean that it's been in vain, because the Lord has given us the promise of eternal life, and that salvation will never be taken away from all who call upon him in truth. So let's see how bad things get, even in the midst of this. Verse 9. Later, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah, who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Hezekiah says, the Lord our God will save us from the hand of king of Assyria, he is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. Did not Hezekiah himself remove his God's high places and altars, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before one altar and burn sacrifices on it? Do you not know what I, ha what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me. How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Now do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my predecessors. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? This is a really interesting section of the Bible because we're allowed to have this letter, this taunting letter thrown in the face of Hezekiah and all the people of uh, Judah that were surrounded there by this sea of Assyrian army. All the other cities in Judah had been taken and, uh, and Jerusalem is surrounded by these people and sends this insulting letter over to them. Don't you believe it? And we're allowed to see how bad it is when for the people of Judah and Hezekiah. And yet Hezekiah is going to trust in the Lord in spite of all this, in spite of the huge forces that are surrounding him. Verse 16, Sennacherib's officers spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. The king also wrote letters insulting the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him. Just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of the other peoples of the world, the work of human hands. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the leaders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons cut him down with a sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. And he brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Hezekiah, king of Judah. 
from then on, he was highly regarded by all the nations. Amen. And we're going to uh, be able to stop in our section with that today. The Lord allowed things to get much, much worse so that he could show the people and deliver them in an even greater, greater way, a miraculous way. And the book of Isaiah details this, where Isaiah writes about the same episode that the angel of the Lord went out in one night and destroyed 185,000 soldiers in one night. And they woke up in the morning, the, the leaders, and there were all the dead bodies, and they retreated. In the records, archaeological records of uh, Sennacherib and other Assyrian kings, this episode is recorded. And the king of Assyria simply writes, I bottled Hezekiah up like a canary in a cage. He can't claim victory, but he had surrounded him. Now we have the truth about it. It's because he couldn't get in the cage <laughs> that he's talking about the canary in the cage. And that's the way it is. And we have uh, this to be so thankful for that we may feel like we're surrounded like a canary in a cage by all kinds of evil, all kinds of afflictions, but the Lord gives deliverance. The Lord will give deliverance to his people. And uh, this is just an indication. Now, you may have recognized a similar theme that happened earlier to one of the kings. In fact, a king of Judah. And as I was preparing for this lesson, I'm thinking, I thought I already did this lesson. <laughs> this is so similar. Almost the same thing happened beforehand to Jehoshaphat. He did all these reforms right in the time of Ahab in the northern. He was a bright spot in the south. He was leading all these reforms. He was calling the people back to faith in the Lord. And a, a huge army came against him. And he still held out in praise and worship to the Lord in spite of all that. And the Lord delivered him too. And I think we're meant to see all, that just as Jehoshaphat was doing the right thing, so Hezekiah was doing the right thing. But both of them faced tremendous opposition and pressure that seems to come out of nowhere while they're doing the right thing, while they're carrying out this reform. And so I believe that this is also an indication that we have to be aware when we are doing the right thing, the evil forces, the forces of the devil, are going to be stirred up against us, too. When we're doing the right thing, we also will face tremendous opposition. But we're not to cave in. We're not to yield to temptation. We're not to throw up our hands and say, oh, what is, uh, what is going on? I must be doing something wrong. I'm, I've got to surrender or anything like that. We just continue to trust in the Lord and we think, oh, this is not even my fault that these things are happening. This is the Lord going to give a great deliverance. And he's going to bring tremendous glory to his name in the face of all this opposition coming against us. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't surrender. Don't say, oh, woe is me. Woe is me. I must be the worst person why did I ever bother this? It's not work. Don't give up. Because the devil comes against those who are doing the right thing. He leaves the people that are doing the wrong thing basically alone to do their thing. But don't give up. Do the right thing. And God will give a great deliverance in his own time. Okay, I'm running out of time. So I want to give you time to talk about this and a little bit of time to react bring out other things that you found along the way. And I, I just want to encourage you with this passage. What else are you finding? What else stood out to you? All right. 
All right, we'll just let that soak in for a while and we'll have a word of prayer then. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, anoint us with your spirit too, to not just survive in a time where opposition comes against us, but to thrive and to be your people standing strong in faith as a witness for all people around the world and, and uh, seeing how faithful Christians, faithful believers can even face tremendous opposition and take great courage if God be for us, who can be against us? Thank you for Hezekiah, his steadfastness. But thank you that we have uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to live in us and to dwell among us and, and in us and in the church and, and, and be victorious over all sin, all evil, all forces, death and the devil are all uh, put to uh their rightful place lord give us the trust and the courage to continue faithfully to believe even should we face this tremendous opposition by evil forces bless your people with courage in jesus name amen all right thank you for joining us today and uh, uh we'll see you next week Bye. 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 Bye.